just to welcome everyone to tonight's Citizens Climate University. It's a weekly webinar program of CCL that provides CCL supporters like you and I with access to in-depth training opportunities on topics relating to climate change and effective climate advocacy. I'm your host, Brett Cease, and tonight's specific topic is gonna to be looking at the March Lobby Day's primary and supporting asks and gearing up for how we can use them in our lobby meetings. So as your team is preparing for your March Lobby Days, we're gonna have a chance to be joined by CCL's Vice President of Government Affairs, Dr. Danny Richter, who's gonna review all of those asks and provide some updates regarding our legislative strategy. Dr. Richter joined CCL staff in 2013 after five years as a volunteer, completing his doctorate and getting paid to do research on all seven continents. As CCL's first staffer in DC, Danny established our DC office where he's been responsible for developing our overall legislative strategy, clarifying the details of our policy and interacting with other groups in DC ever since. He's also seen overseas, uh, overseen CCL's ambitious research program, including many of the studies that you may be familiar from REMI to the household impact study and the recent dividend delivery study. So with that, we're gonna focus on three learning goals tonight. And if you're okay with it, Danny, I actually kick it to you to review these and jump right in. Uh, sounds good, Brett. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to see you. And thanks for spending time with us on a Thursday evening so you can prepare well for your lobby days in just uh, two and a half weeks here. So uh, these are our learning goals for this evening. Uh, first learning goal, this is what I hope you leave this presentation with. Number one, President Biden and Democratic leadership haven't decided what to focus on in the coming climate package. Number two, our primary asks will help us show that carbon pricing is popular. And the third point here is that uncertainty makes picking supporting asks a little bit tricky. So we only have a, a couple of supporting asks this year. Uh, so that's, and let's go onto the agenda. I'm gonna try and get to these learning goals by first setting up some context of what I'm seeing going on in DC. Then we'll spend some time with the primary asks We'll go to the supporting asks. I'll uh, wrap things up with some closing thoughts. And as Brett said, we should have plenty of time about half of this presentation for Q&A. So let's set the context. And here, uncertainty is the name of the game. Uh, something on climate will happen this year. And we have President Biden to thank for that. The reason why something is going to happen this year on climate is because President Biden is prioritizing it. That something may happen either through regular order, which requires 60 votes to get past the filibuster, but only 51 to pass, or Congress may pass something through a process known as budget reconciliation. In this process, no vote to overcome the filibuster is required, but this process tends to be completely partisan and I'm gonna say inelegant for designing policies. Either way, we're likely looking at a package of bills. And what I mean by a package is where you have a lot of different policy ideas lumped together. Democrats so far have not coalesced around a particular policy approach. And I can identify three camps within the Democratic Party so far on climate. First camp is focused on incentives and subsidies. And I would say that this policy, these policies are the least controversial I think they're likely to be included regardless. They already have a long history of bipartisan support. There's another faction that uh, would prefer to see regulations and standards, including a clean energy standard at the center of the coming climate package. And the third faction, which is uh, supporting a carbon price. Obviously we're most aligned with the third faction, but I don't think we're really in a world where Democrats are voting no on the final package if their favorite is not included. Keep this in mind as we continue to see a lot of different policy ideas introduced in the first part of this year. It's no guarantee that any of them, and a carbon price is included in this, will be included in the final package. At the end of the day, what we want is a policy that puts us on a path to zero emissions future, and we wanna see that passed this year. For Republicans, right now, they are extremely uncomfortable. The, the current situation is extremely uncomfortable for Republicans. Uh, it is unclear what the identity of the party is going to be moving forward, but there are a good number of Republicans that want that identity to be one that embraces robust action on climate. 
And I think you see an example uh, last week, Representative Curtis uh, in Utah, and this is Zion Park behind me, so go Utah. Uh, but there was a meeting of 24 Republicans uh, led by Representative Curtis, uh, who they want to see climate be a part of the Republican Party, and we would like to see that too. So what are we going to do about it? The way I see it, we have two imperatives in this context of uncertainty. Our first imperative is, since it's not a guarantee that a carbon price will be included in the climate package, we need to do what we can to make sure that it is included. And our second imperative is to have relevance, regardless of whether the future holds a regular order pathway or a reconciliation pathway. If we are not at the table, then we can't have a voice pushing for things to move in the direction of the carbon fee and dividend policy that we love so much. So our first imperative, speaking on the first imperative, uh, and that is to have a carbon price included in a climate package, I see two pathways to get there. Uh, the first pathway is to convince Democrats that a carbon price is sufficiently popular that they would actually be bad politicians if they don't support it, because they would be failing to reflect their constituents' will. The second pathway is to convince Republicans to get on board with a carbon price. And I think the number that guarantees success here, I think if we get three or more in the Senate, I think we have success. If we get 10 or more in the House, I think we have success. On the second imperative, which again is having rev relevance for citizens climate lobby, regardless of whether we're in a regular order pathway for climate or a reconciliation pathway for climate, uh, we are going to be focusing on regular order. There are a lot of reasons for this. Since reconciliation is almost certain to be just completely partisan, pushing for regular order is certainly more comfortable for CCL, but we don't necessarily wanna do things just before, because they're comfortable. So the question is, does pushing for regular order hurt our opportunity to have a voice in the reconciliation process? And I think the answer is pretty clearly no especially if we are successful in getting Republican support for standalone regular order bills. So speaking only about a bill through regular order to your members of Congress is a no regret strategy. It enables us to meet our second imperative of having a voice in the discussions around either a regular order process or a reconciliation process. The one wrinkle to this is going to be particularly prominent among Democrats, and I think especially among House Democrats. Many of these Democrats may be thinking entirely through the lens of reconciliation. And so for those Democrats, if you come talking about regular order, they may question that. So you may need a justification for why you were trying, why we are trying to move something forward through regular order. And as I said, there are many good reasons, there are many good strategic reasons for this, which you can share in your meetings if this comes up. And I'll just go through a few here. Any bipartisan support that we get on a regular order bill makes those elements of the reconciliation package less controversial, both, both for this year and into the future. Getting bipartisan support on a regular order bill makes a reconciliation process more durable. Any support we get for regular order carbon prices enables us to go bigger on climate and reconciliation. So if we have a lot of support between something uh, behind something big like the Energy Innovation Carbon Dividend Act, that creates political will to at least match that, that uh, ambition through reconciliation. Next, any support that we get for a regular order bill serves as discovery for how different messages play out and what the other side is or is not open to. We, don't, we can't find that out if there's nothing out there and regular order is a good way to get those out there. A regular order bill enables businesses to be more specific in their support than they already have been. Again, this increases the support for a reconciliation bill and for greater ambition. Next, key elements of a reconciliation bill could be ruled not reconcilable late in the game. This could make it not worthwhile or at least compromise the effectiveness of the climate part of that reconciliation bill. We saw an example of this just last week, just this past Saturday, when the $15 minimum wage provision 
of the current reconciliation bill that Democrats are pr uh, pushing was ruled not reconcilable by the Senate parliamentarian. So there, it's just, it's just gone. That could happen uh, if we end up in a reconciliation world. And so having uh, a regular order bill uh, is a good way to have a backup. And you might as well remind these concerned Democrats that bipartisanship is Biden's preference. Any success here helps Biden. For Republicans, I really don't think you're going to have any challenge talking about regular order. They're almost certain to be excluded from discussions around a reconciliation bill. So if you're talking about regular order, you're talking about including Republicans. And uh, there, there are a lot of groups, there are a lot of politicians who are actively trying to exclude Republicans. So speaking about regular order, you're speaking the language uh, of Republicans there. So in conclusion, we want to keep our conversations focused on regular order. We want to point out that any success in getting bipartisan support for a regular order bill makes those provisions, if included in reconciliation, less susceptible to attack, even if the final vote is party line. And so that's where we're going to be focusing. So uh, now we're going to talk about primary asks. And really what these primary asks are geared towards is responding to that first imperative that I mentioned. And that is making a carbon price more popular so that it is included in whatever package around climate uh, we end up in. And as I mentioned, there are two pathways that I see to assure success here. The first pathway, and I'll focus on this first, is to convince Democrats it's sufficiently popular that if they don't support it, they'll be failing to reflect their constituents' will. So both of the Democratic primary asks, we have we actually have four primary asks this year for Democrats in the House, Democrats in the Senate, for Republicans in the House, Republicans in the Senate. This is very unusual. We don't usually do that, but I think the current politics justifies it. So uh, the this is the pathway we're pursuing with the Democrat primary asks. And the second pathway, which I'll get to when I cover the Republican primary asks, is to convince Republicans to get on board with the price on carbon, shooting for three or more Republicans in the Senate and 10 or more in the House. And so let's start with Democrats. Because they are undecided, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to truly influence the discussion. And that's what we're trying to do here. Starting in the House, we want to get as many Democrats as possible on the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. While we may have been skittish about imbalance in the past, with Democrats in control of both chambers of commerce, Congress, uh, this is not the time to have mixed feelings about a good thing. Let's pack as many Democrats as we possibly can onto that bill. In fact, with 222 Democrats in the House, I would like to see more than half that. I'm targeting 112 or more to join the bill when Deutsch reintroduces it. We are going to be trying to make the case to Democrats by highlighting urgency. We want to compete purely on emissions reductions in this climate debate, purely on climate. If this is going to pass as part of the package, there are going to be plenty of opportunities in that package to address other Democratic priorities. We are the climate folks. So that's what we're going to talk about. And we like the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act because it's big. It satisfies us, the climate folks, on an intellectual and on an emotional level because it's big, it's fast, and it's robust. And so that's what we want to bring to Democrats in the House. So these are our, our main messaging. We're highlighting urgency, uh, fast, effective, and durable. Uh, and so we're also, we also have a companion document. I'll get to that in a moment. But first, I want to talk about those talking points. And these talking points are actually going to be the same, both for Democrats in the House and in the Senate. So uh, for the first talking point, FAST, and again, these are just as they are on the primary ask, it's FAST. So a carbon fee or tax starts to slash emissions immediately as businesses and consumers plan for the pollution charge. The Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act enforces accountability after just nine months. No other policy type can deliver comparable emissions accountability faster. And uh, just nine months, it is actually in the bill text 270 days, uh, which is nine months. So that's, that's in the bill text. That's when it starts. This is also effective. The economy-wide carbon fee we're asking you to support covers over 80% of U.S. emissions at a stroke. 
Compare that with the piecemeal sectoral approach that requires a complex maze of policies for each sector. That is transportation, electricity, industry, and buildings. So the key component here is that it's economy wide with one policy. And last point, it's durable. The Trump administration showed clearly how fragile a regulatory approach can be. For durability, Congress must act. Legislation with broad support is required, and a carbon price has the best chance for bipartisan support in Congress. Now, for the many people on this call who have an existing co-sponsor as your member of Congress, first of all, I want you to ask them to confirm that they're still on the co-sponsor list with the Deutsch office. And that can be a fairly quick interaction. If so, then you want the, I want you to ask them to bring a friend to the party, Democrat or Republican. We want to make sure this fast, effective, and durable policy is part of Biden's climate package. To acknowledge and disarm those Democrats who have a preference that is not a carbon price, at the bottom of the ask, we include the line, a carbon price is not a silver bullet, but it's the biggest single thing we can do and it makes everything else we need to do easier. Please help us with your support. And remember, as always, when you're coming into these meetings, you are constituents, and it always helps to tell a personal story and to bring some of your, and in that, you, you want that to stand out. So bring out some of your emotion behind these points. Again, we're, we're the climate folks. I know we all care about this deeply, so don't be afraid to bring some of your emotions, some of your feeling, behind these points and why you want to see a, a carbon price, especially this policy included in the coming climate package. In the Senate, we have all the same talking points, but we're going to have a more generalized ask. ask. And that ask is be ambitious, co-sponsor a carbon price. And the reason for this is that all last Congress, we were asking senators to talk to Chris Coons and to get the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act uh, get on that bill as a co-sponsor when it was reintroduced. But it was never reintroduced. Even though we were asking for this for the whole Congress, it was never reintroduced. And I want to learn from that. I also want us to be responsive to our imperative, which is carbon pricing must be a part of the discussion. This needs to be popular among Democrats, and this primary ask is geared towards doing that by increasing the number of Democratic senators currently co-sponsoring a carbon price. Though the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act was never reintroduced in the Senate, there were three ambitious carbon fees or taxes that were introduced, and so we're asking Democratic senators to co-sponsor those. We do have intelligence from our conversations with some of these offices that all three are going to be reintroduced this Congress, and they're re going to be reintroduced early. So we feel good about equipping you with this ask. By our lobby day or soon after, each of these bills should be relevant. And these bills are the American Opportunity and Carbon Fee Act. This is in the 116th. There's the bill number S1128. This was introduced by Senators Whitehouse and Schatz. The Climate Action Rebate Act, also in the 116th, there's the bill number that was Senators Coons and Feinstein. The America's Clean Future Act, Future Fund Act was introduced uh, by Senator Durbin late in the 116th. And there at the bottom, you see the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, which was introduced in the 115th Congress. And it's important to say the Congress number, because when you look up at congress.gov, they, of course, recycle the bill numbers. So uh, for members of Congress, you do have to specify which Congress these were uh, reintroduced in, but that's, that's on the ask. All of, this, yeah, all of this is included in the first paragraph of the Senate Democrat primary ask. Now, as I mentioned, we have a companion document for this. For both House and Senate Democrats, we're, we have the same companion document, and that is carbon pricing is popular. For those of you who lobbied in December, this will look familiar to you. However, it's been updated with votes, and the numbers have been updated because you've just been so gosh darn busy getting more endorsements, so thank you for that. Uh, this handout, handout will enable you to cite, to cite the support of scientists, economists, businesses, faith groups, local governments, and other countries. I also want to just make a note that the statements in this document are why we put carbon pricing instead of fee and dividend. Carbon pricing is a more general term, and the fact is that a lot of these quotes reference 
a carbon price. They don't reference fee and dividend. So uh, we can't use these statements and maintain, maintain our reputation for honesty unless we accurately cite them. So that's the reason for a carbon price, but uh, we are still, still clear that our preference is for fee and dividend. Uh, we're using the more general term to cite these, these uh, endorsers so that we can be at the table and push for something that is closer to fee and dividend. So now let's, let's think about Republicans now. Again, this is to respond to our first imperative. And for Republicans, our goal is to have Republicans get on board with the price on carbon. And we want three or more in the Senate, and we want 10 or more in, in the House. And so let's start in the Senate. Though we could ask them to co-sponsor one of the Senate bills, as we did for Democrats, none of those three bills have a regulatory simplification. The only one that does is the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, again, which was introduced in the 115th Congress, and nothing, not one thing that I've heard over the past seven years has made me think that Republicans can stomach a carbon pricing bill that doesn't also do something to simplify regulations. So to get them to the table, to get Republicans to the table and to line up with what business wants, if the Republican party wishes to continue to be the party of business, we're gonna ask them to heed what business is saying. And so in the Senate, we're specifying that we want Republican senators to support the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And here we have actually different talking points for Republicans than we did from Democrats. And those talking points are effective, it's policy effective, it's good for the economy, it's durable, and it's fair. And so let's, let's look at those uh, talking points in a little bit more detail. It's effective. The economy-wide carbon fee covers over 80% of U.S. emissions. Compare that with a piecemeal sectoral approach that requires a complex maze of policies for each sector, transportation, electricity, industry, and buildings. Second theme is it's good for the economy. A revenue-neutral carbon price strengthens the economy and creates new job opportunities without increasing the deficit, all while stabilizing climate risk. Regulations are just not as good for the economy. Next point is durable. Back and forth, regulatory regimes destroy business confidence. Only congressional action can provide businesses with the durability and predictability they need to be competitive in a global market. A carbon price is the best chance for bipartisan support. And last talking point, it's fair. Carbon price, with, hmm, uh, sorry, I, I, chat is blocking my view. Uh, a carbon price where funds are returned to all households gives everyone the liberty to change their behavior or not. Those who decide to change their behavior will be rewarded, but everyone has the same incentive and opportunity to do so. In the House, uh, for Republicans, there were other options that Republicans could sign on for, but our favorite by far, because it's the most ambitious in terms of CO2 reductions, is the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. So for Republicans in the House, the ask is get to the table, support a carbon price. But in the ask sheet, we are using the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act as an example. But the fact is that while there was only one bipartisan bill with any regulatory simplification in the Senate, in the House, there were actually four bills. Those were the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, the Market Choice Act, the Swap Act, and the Raise Wages Cut Carbon Act. But unlike the Senate ask, these bills are not named. I'm not aware of anyone still pushing for the Swap Act or the Raise Wages Cut Carbon Act, and I'm fairly certain that the Market Choice Act does not meet our second bottom line of good for the bottom 40% of earners. Also, the fact that there were four bills instead of one indicates there's just a little bit more creativity in the House. So in this one, this ask for House Republicans, we're asking them to use that creativity however they want. I think that any Republicans on any carbon pricing bill helps that policy, carbon pricing, get into Biden's package responding to our first imperative. So we are telling Republicans in the House, just get to the table. But we are using in this ask the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act as an example. Now, moving on to the companion document, just as we had different talking points for Republicans and Democrats, we have a different companion document for Republicans. And this one focuses exclusively on business support. 
And uh, this is because there's some really surprising, exciting business support to highlight. Uh, we can talk about the U.S. Chamber of Commerce talking about market-based solutions and saying that a carbon price is consistent with those. We can talk about the Business Roundtable explicitly talking about a carbon price. We can even start talking about the American Petroleum Institute. And so uh, for these, I mean, if you have the U.S. Chamber, the Business Roundtable, and the American Petroleum Institute supporting a particular policy idea, this really should make it very easy, in theory, for Republicans to get on board with that. And so that's what we want to highlight, uh, bringing out only those uh, these businesses, these business organizations, it enables us to focus on what we think Republicans are paying most attention to, and it enables us to have longer quotes uh, so that we can be a little bit more impressive there. Of course, if you want to use this business-focused companion document with Democratic meetings, you're welcome to do that. Alternately, if you want to use the one that we are suggesting for Democratic meetings, if you want to use that with your Republican, you're welcome to do that too. This is this order, having this one with Republicans and the previous one we showed with Democrats, we think that that's going to work the best in the largest number of cases. But as usual, we trust our volunteers. You know your member and you, we leave it up to you to determine which one is gonna be most useful uh, for your members of Congress. Uh, and it's, it's a reflection of the unusually dynamic year that we find ourselves in and the imperative uh, that we, we feel we need to uh, respond to with those primary asks. So now let's talk about supporting asks. Uh, and this is also going to be about navigating the very dynamic context that we find ourselves in. So before I even start about talking about the supporting asks, I want to highlight the very odd fact that it is entirely possible that none of the bills we'll be asking for, either as primary asks or secondary asks, will have been introduced yet when we get to March 22nd. And we don't like doing that, but uh, the fact is that we've never done a DC-centered lobby day this early in a new Congress, particularly not one in which that also overlaps with a new presidential administration. So this is, uh, for those of you who have been uh, attended a recent regional conference, uh, we're in CCL's lame duck here. <laughs> And so this is a part of the lame duck. A lot of these bills may not, all of these bills as possible may not even be introduced. Uh, so we're, but we're gonna, we're gonna take it in stride and do the best we can. And so here are the dominant considerations for how we arrived at our choices uh, for supporting asks. All of these supporting asks too, we have two supporting asks, they're bipartisan, they're complementary to the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. Those are the ones we usually have. But because we're also looking at climate being addressed in a real way this year, and because that could be either through a regular order or reconciliation bill, the calculations that members of Congress are going through on whether or not to introduce a bill and whether or not to prioritize one of their bills or another, they're unusually scrambled. Members will have to make choices about they really, what they really want to put their time into given the timeline. And that means that some of the bills that we were expecting to be introduced may be put aside in favor of bigger priorities, or they may potentially not be introduced at all. And so we are being extra careful about how we direct you. We don't want you advocating for something that isn't ever going to be introduced because that's gonna be a waste of your precious time with your member of Congress. And so we've been, uh, we've erred on the conservative side here. And so, as I said, we have just two supporting asks and those supporting asks are the Growing Climate Solutions Act and the Reclaim Act. Both of these have been supporting asks before. And for the Growing Climate Solutions Act, we know that this is going to be an early priority, the early priority of the Senate Climate Solutions Caucus. It is supported by big names in agriculture, including the Farm Bureau. I will remind you, because of the way we've structured our democracy, agriculture has unusual influence in the Senate. Being able to say that we are supporting a climate bill that the Farm Bureau is also supporting is going to make your senators look at you in a different way. That new way of looking at us and the organization you represent may in fact be key to success on a carbon price. So that's the Growing Climate Solutions Act. And the second one is the Reclaim Act. 
this might actually be the first of the bills uh, to be introduced, uh, so we'll, we'll see. Uh, but the Reclaim Act is a bill that was found by our coal country action team. There exists a coalition supporting it that we remain in contact with and which has thanked us for the support we've lent to it already. They've said that it's reinvigorated the effort and our volunteers have said very clearly that their support for this bill has opened new doors with their hard to get members. So we're supporting it again and we did get intelligence as I said that this should be introduced soon. This may be the first one uh, of all the bills to be reintroduced. Remember, the goal of supporting ASK is to complement the main thrust of our advocacy. It's to give a different look to what we're doing. And uh, all, we've thrown a lot of resources at you, and all these resources are available on CCL Community. And so if you go to CCL Community, uh, and if you go to the left-hand bar, uh, and you go to Lobbying Congress, uh, you can find primary asks and supporting asks on that page. They're all already uploaded. And note that uh, you can find the supporting documents. Carbon pricing is popular and carbon pricing is popular with business. Those are in the primary ask page. Uh, Brett, did I forget anything there with the resources on community? I don't think so. They're all updated. And uh, you can see the links in the chat we've already put there for people that are interested. All right. Uh, and I also want to just emphasize again that we, we trust you. Uh, you do not have to limit yourselves to these two supporting asks. I will remind you uh, that, as I said, the Reclaim Act actually started out not as an official CCL ask, but it started out as an ask that the Coal Country Action Team tried out. They decided that this was something that would help them build a relationship with their Coal Country members of Congress. And so they tried it out. It worked. Uh, we listened to them when they said this is helping them build the relationship. We are an organization still that listens to our volunteers, and now it is an official CCL uh, supporting ask. So you can choose another bill if you and your team agree that that is uh, the best way to move your relationship forward. Or you could also consider something that is not a, a directly attached to a bill to softer ask such as you could consider an En-ROADS demonstration, either for your member of Congress, if you're talking with the staff, or I know of at least one state that is uh, thinking about an En-ROADS demonstration for their delegation. You consider a specific briefing. I know a lot of you have identified uh, prominent endorsers or experts in your district or in your state who you'd like to get in front of your member of Congress or members of Congress. You could ask if they'd be willing to be briefed by that endorser or expert. Uh, for those, especially those who are already a co-sponsor on any of the bills that we're asking them to support, you can ask them to express support for carbon pricing on any of the many platforms that members of Congress use to express their views. That might be through their social media platforms, it might be through their website, it might be uh, in speeches. So these are all quote unquote softer supporting asks that you could consider uh, making, but as with, as always, uh, just make sure that you and your group agree uh, what is gonna be your primary ask and what is gonna be your supporting asks before you go into the meeting. Uh, and so on to conclusions, uh, President Biden has prioritized climate. So a climate package is coming. We don't know what's going to be the backbone of that package, and we don't know if it's going to be sent to Biden's desk to sign into law via regular order or via reconciliation. We have two imperatives here at CCL. The first imperative is to make sure carbon price is the backbone of that package, and two, to make sure that CCL has influence regardless of whether it's regular order or reconciliation. And the reason we want that influence is to steer the sausage making towards what we've always been for, and dividend. There are two paths to achieving our first imperative, to convince Democrats that carbon pricing is popular, and second, to get Republicans as co-sponsors for regular order carbon pricing bills. Our primary asks are geared towards advancing along both these pathways. The second imperative we are going to address by focusing our lobbying on regular order. This is the usual schoolhouse rocks way of doing things. Uh, if you come across an office, most likely House Democrats, who are only in a reconciliation mindset, I laid out a list of arguments you can use to highlight the strategic benefits of advancing climate bill through regular order. For our supporting asks, we focused on just two bills, the Growing Climate Solutions Act and the Reclaim Act. 
We would normally include more, but the fact that it's so early in the session and the politics are so unusual and unsettled has made it difficult to see what will actually be worth supporting. And so we've played it safe so as not to waste your precious time uh, with your member offices. As always, if you'd like to make a different supporting ask, you may. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. You are getting a lot of love in the chat. Don't let up, everyone. Give those plus ones. Give those emoticon reactions, whatever you want to do to thank our very own Dr. Richter for an informative hour of jam-packed content and programming. And we'll throw that love right back to all of you. As Marshall would remind each of us, you are the cavalry making our charge into our March Lobby Week possible. We hope that you feel empowered and equipped with the information that you need to have the impact that we all will collectively empower with our March lobby meetings. And we can't wait to hear about how they go. So any closing words of wisdom, Danny? Have fun. Go out, get some co-sponsors. We can't wait to hear about them, everyone. Stay in touch, stay safe, and thank you for all the hard work out there making this possible. We'll talk to you soon, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.